hey, y'all, a thing that you're probably going to notice about this episode, though maybe not, is that I'm not in it. I think people will notice. Uh, we kind of spend the first maybe 10 minutes just lamenting your absence. Really? Uh, well, we that's do. very kind of you and obviously also necessary for my giant ego. Um, I was not here because I messed up my back and Sam very graciously offered to have this interview because it was happening at night and I could no longer sit vertically in a chair by uh, the 6 p.m. recording window. Um, so... I was not there for our recording with our very first guest and we didn't want to reschedule because it had been on the books for a long time and we were super excited about it. So Sam does this one solo. He's taken the interviewer seat like I did during the Future of HR series. Mm -hmm. I channeled my inner Barbara Walters slash Rodney Evans. Did you make the hair like big hair, big hair? There's hair related uh, snafus, which is the fact that I was freshly shaven and our Co, uh, our, our, our interview had the most amazing beard I've ever seen. His name is Dr. Jason Fox. And we talked I about mean, all sorts of nerdy organization stuff. Just based on the stills that I saw after, I have never seen you so outclassed in any domain <laughs> as in the mustache <laughs> department with Dr. It's Jason true. Fox. Oh, uh, it was, yeah, he, he very much won uh, that. I tried to hold my own. Intellectually, conversationally, mm -hmm. in, in what we talked about. We talked about uh, having a teacher mentality in this work. He asked me a really good question that kind of caught me off guard. And we talked about, about that. We talked about meaningful progress in, in organizations and what that actually means and how you can use quests and questing to make meaningful progress cool. in organizations, which is what his book is, is all about. I love and that part of We just work. generally nerded out for a while. Um, we kind of like without you there, nobody was really there to like kind of keep my nerdiest impulses in check. And we just kind of went for it. Uh, so I, I hope folks enjoy it. I love that. I'm sure it was a great conversation. Um, I am sad to have missed it. I will be listening along with everybody else out there. Um, Sam, thanks for taking this one for the team. Uh, and for the rest of you, I hope you enjoy it. I hope we all enjoy it. All right, let's roll it. Hey everybody, welcome back to At Work With The Ready, a podcast about modernizing organizations as the future of work meets the present. I'm Sam Sperlin, and that gentleman over there is notably not Rodney Evans. It's Dr. Jason Fox. Hello. Rodney's feeling a little under the weather uh, today, so we have not replaced her permanently, only for this one single episode. And replace is probably the wrong word. How does that, how does that word hit you, uh, <laughs> Dr. Fox? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as I was just Rodney. saying, I was, I was attuned to like, oh, how can I jump in and correct you? Um, yeah, um, I, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm personally grieving at the moment because I've been so looking forward to my attempts to woo Rodney uh, in real time. Um, but uh, you know that'll have to happen another day, um, and so I shall. And uh, you know, you shall be a wonderful company uh, in this conversation. All right, Jason, let's tell people a little bit about who you are, and I'm going to take a first crack at it, and then you can uh, elaborate as you see fit. So, Jason is a wizard philosopher and best-selling author of *The Game Changer* and *How to Lead a Quest*. He's a motivational speaker, a university lecturer, and senior leadership advisor to Fortune 500 companies all over the world, helping teams move beyond the default and toward meaningful progress. Jason, how'd I do? What did I, what did oh, I get right? What did I get you wrong? Know, that's elegant. You hit on all the kind of <laughs> official beats there. I mean, personally, when I hear people's intros that have been professionally groomed for the market, um, yeah. I'm glad that you kept it short anyway. Um, I think sure. the interesting overlaps here are, uh, it was quite fascinating. When I wrote The Game Changer, it was in the final stages of it that I came across Aaron Dignan's book, uh, Game Frame. And then okay, yeah. I, I came across Aaron's world, like fell in love with this thinking that there's this amazing evolution where, you know, uh, I saw him at a conference in New York and he's talking about complex adaptive systems. And then I saw, what was it, the, the undercurrent or what was the, mm -hmm. the before pre- Undercurrent, the yeah. Yeah, and then the yeah. ready emerged, and then brave new work emerged, and I found myself using, uh, you know, the the questions within brave new work in a lot of the leadership and strategy development work that I was doing, and there's something so charming about how questions remain relevant across contexts and time, and 
and and and the, the work of the ready i've referred clients to you guys they've been very happy with the uh the the service you have provided um elated <laughs> and there is something to be said about this context that we kind of find ourselves in as we're you know these on, on the other side of the world and yet there's a there's a yeah. resonance that is felt you, you say modernizing the workplace there's definitely a a felt sense that things need to change and so yeah, I think from from my own bio thing, I've I've just there's been interesting parallel uh, interweavings at times. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I went with the term wizard um, naively at first because wizards are cool and they're much much better alternative to thought leader or expert or <laughs> things like that. It's very true. Very true. Yeah. Before we get too far in, we should start with a check-in question. If we get too far in without doing a check-in question, people will people will riot, uh, and we don't want that on our hands. You don't want to be the cause of of some sort of podcast riot. Uh, so we should we should check in. Yeah. All right, people tap. I've got a check-in question for second you. thing. Where's where's my check-in? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So. Uh, we heard you live in an old chocolate factory. Is that still true? Yes, ostensibly. Okay. So, check-in question. What's your favorite form of chocolate? Form? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Form. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, um, uh, I do prefer chocolate in solid form, um, more so okay. than a hot chocolate. I've never had gaseous uh, chocolate, but um, yeah, so, I, I guess that's really state. Fun thing to think it? about. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, I've tried to be one of those mature adults that eats like 95% cocoa dark chocolate yeah. um, and I yeah. can't get there. I think, I'm a, I think I'm a basic bitch when it comes to chocolate. Like I like, <laughs> I, you know, somewhere between normal milk chocolate and dark is my sweet okay. spot because it's yeah. given me a little bit yeah. of edge, but, um, but still the satisfaction of uh, normal milk chocolate. Okay, How about cool. You? Yeah, I, I like that. I'm a little bit self-conscious with this question because I have heard that Americans have a reputation of just having garbage chocolate compared to like Europeans, at least. I feel like I have met many a European who is like, your chocolate, what you call chocolate in the US is just horrible. So I'm a little bit, a uh, little bit hesitant, but my favorite form also solid, not gaseous or liquid, although hot chocolate's pretty good. Um, Snickers, a Snickers bar, like they're, <laughs> okay, that's my go-to. Wow. All right. There Very go. specific, right? I, I gotta say, I do like this, uh, European envy arc that seems to be a theme over yeah. the last few episodes, <laughs> whilst you guys have your summer holidays. And Better chocolate and the ability to go on vacation. That's like, right. Like they've got it made over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See long, how long we can keep this thread alive. Exactly. All right, cool. Now we're checked in. We can we can really uh, dig into to the stuff here. And um, you started going into this a little bit, but I'd love to actually dig deeper into the whole kind of magic and wizardry uh, angle on on um, kind of some of the branding that you've done in How to Lead a Quest, your your book, um, your website, your newsletter. Just tell us a little bit more because I feel like it's a much it's, it's more than just kind of like a cute branding thing. Like you have put some thought into this and I'd love to, to hear a little bit more about why, of what, why of, of all of that. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the relevance for this, for, for folks that are listening is really about, um, something that James Cast, the author of finite and infinite games, a vision of life as play and possibility. He has this line that finite players play within boundaries, infinite players play with boundaries finite players play to win, infinite players play to continue the play. And yeah. for anyone hearing this, there's a lot of forms that appear to be rigid and set in the world of work, in the world of, you know, what role we give ourselves, the titles, which is mostly just theater. Um, this is just part of the coordination theater. And I think there's an opportunity for folks to play with these parameters. Um, I also want to point out that this conversation is completely emergent. I, well, at least I don't know of any script or arc uh, other than the check-in and um, and so on. Yeah. And 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 there's something I think so special about flirting with the danger and the brilliance of generative ambiguity. Um, this could have been a recipe for underwhelming success. Like this could have been a bunch of questions that you ask uh, that are predictable. Uh, and we go down a path and, and we end up with some, some mediocre incremental thing. And this is what a lot of business does. But when we flirt with emergence, 
what we're doing instead is creating the conditions for magic to happen. And when I think of magic, um, and this is going to be interesting, I was looking forward to playing in the interplay between uh, science and, and woo with <laughs> you and Rodney, but when I think of yeah, magic, yeah. <laughs> I think of a phenomenon that is occurring at a level of complexity beyond our ability to either comprehend or articulate. Yeah. Like yeah. my phone works like magic. Uh, I can't describe yeah. how it works, but it works like a kind of magic. And so when we start playing with all these sensibilities and then we start thinking about archetypes uh, which have existed as consistent patterns across time, uh, the wizard stuff kind of appears in that sense, but it also translates to, um, you know, in software you use a wizard to help you uh, to run particular tasks and so on. It makes yeah. it makes things yeah. a little yeah. bit easier. I mean, the, the world of thought leaders and experts in this competitive information landscape that is an attention slash destruction economy is rife with bullshit. And it takes a kind of knowingness to dance amidst it all whilst maintaining a level of intellectual honesty and integrity. And so, yeah, that's a yeah. long answer to your question about the wizard stuff. I love that. No, I love How that. I love the point about magic too, in the sense that you know, if Rodney was here, this would be her entrance for tarot and talking about tarot. And I oh, yeah. am in many ways am allergic to woo. At least that is how I have self-described. However, I have done lots and lots of reading about physics and, you know, astrophysics. And you don't have to read too much about quantum mechanics and just like how little we actually understand what is happening in in some of the in, in, in that world to be not that far away from magic. Uh, and that's taking like the science route to a very kind of similar place. There's, there's something there. I'm just shuffling my tarot deck as we, uh, as we speak here, but <laughs> nice. by the way, um, I, I, there's something you said that you, you say the science path towards it. Um, and there's something so fascinating. This is a rather taboo topic that we're going to go into. Um, so, you know, I just assume that I've given all the appropriate caveats. Um, of course. When it comes to, uh, we often think about, this is so dangerous as a topic, so <laughs> we have to be really careful. Uh, when it comes to leadership development uh, and things like that, there are so many overlaps between leadership development and adult development. And yes. one of the things when it comes to adult development is the complexity of our thinking. The comfort that we have at various, you know, how do I say this? Some folks are quite comfortable being amidst uh, uh, conflicting truths, uh, being amidst a space in which is complex, it's emergent, it's uh, the parts relate in nonlinear fashion. And one could think about this as like you've got rational thinking, then you've got meta-rational thinking, which sometimes looks like magic. You've got systematic thinking, and then you've got metasystemic thinking, which is where you're, you're kind of in a space that isn't kind of as concrete, but allows you to compare and contrast and make better decisions from that level of abstraction. And once we're at that level of abstraction, we start to view complexity. We start thinking about the universe as it's expanding from the Big Bang and, you know, from right. hydrogen to other elements to atoms and molecules and so on, all to, you know, life as we are. And, and the thing is, the Big Bang is still happening. We're still unfurling into these higher orders and complexity. And that's a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, in most of the business landscape, we want to stamp down complexity and keep things simple. Yeah. And I think that sometimes, at some, in some contexts, hobbles our ability to deftly navigate the complexity, the ambiguity and the, of the emergence. I have a question for you, though. Sure. Just so, that, just so I can calibrate where we're at here. If we were to think about a particular archetype, and you can choose a mythic archetype here, I wonder what, what do you resonate with, with regards to like a role that you play? And it might not be A, of course, where we contain multitudes, but... What archetype do you see yourself playing? Yeah. Specifically kind of in my, in, in the context of the work that I'm doing at, at the ready or are you, okay. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say both, but I have, yeah. I have seen, I have seen, yeah. you know, photos of you doing marathons and other things like that. So, you know, I, I get there's a sure. indomitable warrior spirit within you. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's what I'm trying to put out, uh, put out <laughs> into the world. Um, you know, I think Again. when it comes to my work at, the ready, the word that's coming to mind, which is really interesting because of my early career experience is teacher. 
Uh, so mm-hmm. I originally went to school to be a teacher, and I was a teacher in uh, the kind of the high school level teaching history, economics, that sort of thing, before, um, for a series of reasons, deciding to make a major pivot that landed here. But I find myself most energized in the work that we're doing within organizations. I find myself having these um, flashbacks to like 20 year old me, 22 year old me as a teacher, um, which is very, I've never, I, I don't think I've ever put words to it quite that way before. I revere teachers so much. There's, I, I've, I've contemplated it being one of my words for a year as a theme to kind of flex into a little bit yeah. more. Teachers are so good at uh, navigating complexity in a way that identifies the fractal principles, the principles that hold true across different orders of complexity. <clears throat> and they also don't suffer from the curse of knowledge. Like some of us, when it comes to like the more time we spend knowing things, the, the, the less our empathy for folks that are beginning on the journey. And it's something I experience yeah. quite a lot. Like my impatience for organizations trying to grapple with what I consider to be fairly simple concepts like asynchronous communication. Uh, right. it, it, you know, I'm, I'm hobbled because of this curse of knowledge, but a good teacher is able to meet folks with patience and give them whatever they need to get them to the next space. So I think it's a, right. a really incredible right. gift. And I also want to just, you know, throw back to something that Rodney said in a, a few episodes ago, she was observing how some people say something like, I am the CEO or I am this. Right. And, yeah. and she was like, no, dude, uh, no, my dude or whatever. <laughs> how she says, um, that is a role that you play. It's a play. good Rodney impression. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. I'll try. That is, a, that is a role that you play. And I think mm-hmm. this sense of role playing really helps to create a nice kind of sincere, ironic distance from the self and the role that we're playing. And when we're thinking yeah. about roles that we play, we're thinking, how are we contributing to this kind of greater whole, this, this team that we're part of? And having some sense of how we play our roles, you know, means that collectively we're, we're more efficacious. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what do you do much with world building or do you think about world building in the context of, of organizations? Because that's where my head goes. We start talking about role playing and the fact that reading your book, How to Lead a Quest, when I hear the word quest, I think of games, I think of video games, I think of D&D, that sort of thing. So how, how does world building play a role in kind of how organizations make sense of, of themselves or could make sense of themselves? I love that concept. World building, this is a great question. There is, within any culture, there is like a, there's a semiotic ecology, like there is a, a bunch of symbols that we have uh, and what we make things mean and how we navigate those meaning structures. There are rituals that we have, uh, sacred routines, where we deliberately carve out time against the grain of busyness to progress the things that matter. Um, And there are conventions that, again, if we go back to what I was saying at the start, like we can play with all of these things. Like I, there's this um, thinker that I really admire, Venkatesh Rao, who wrote this uh, series on um, lawcraft, lands of lawcraft, a meta modern guide to management where he talked about how sometimes within organizations you have these internal stories that aren't a marketing thing. They only make sense in the context of the internal culture. Right. The ready probably has them, things that happen on, you know, mm-hmm. the, the team yeah. get together and stuff like that, internal law, which is part of the kind of cultural code. And I think that if we have intentional awareness about this, we can start to cultivate the kinds of structures that create the kinds of conditions for the kinds of behaviors that we wish to see emerge. Like I was working with a a friend and a client um, last week and they're working on what they can call their knowledge commons uh, internally. And the metaphors they're using is all very much about gardening, tending, you know, if you see a Mm -hmm. weed, you know, pluck it out or something, update it. What they want to avoid is the dead language of the intranet or some sort of repository or just some place to dump information. They want to see it as a living system of which we are all gardeners and tenders. And that is a kind of world building as well. And I think when people are attuned to this and then start to bring some creativity, imagination and intentionality without going too far out, because you can easily lose the thread with this stuff. You've got to stay, stay grounded. But there's also a lot of room for enchantment in that sense which is a different way of looking yeah. at something that, that brings it more alive. 
Yeah. How do you help organizations start to see themselves better and, and so that all of these levers that are available to potentially pull or play with actually start to become visible to them? I feel like that's what I spend a lot of time trying to help organizations do is, is see themselves in a way that allows them to see all of the potential places they could intervene that I am seeing. Uh, but it's not helpful if only I can see it. They have to be able to see it for themselves. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, I love your teacher energies. This is so good. I mean, because partly, <laughs> partly our role, right, is to make ourselves redundant. We don't want to create a dependency yeah. and we don't want to be the source of the creative inspiration. We want to create the conditions for creative inspiration to happen within the team itself. Yeah. Um, the question of how, though, I mean, as a solo um, uh, wizard, mercenary wizard, I kind of come in and I catalyze things usually at around the strategy or leadership offsite stage. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I stick around with teams for a while, anywhere between six to six months to two years uh, with that, you know, gentle coaching, nudging, provocations and so on. And sometimes with these things, to, to really catalyze things, you need a combination of influence and authority. Um, right. but then you, ideally you want those that have authority and influence to have enough, uh, developmental sensibilities that they're not swept up in their own ego and they're kind of, they're actually cultivating and surfacing what, what is it, what is emerging within the, the cultural context. So long story short, I do my bit. And then when it comes to the deeper enterprise work, hopefully some things have surfaced. Uh, but that's usually yeah. when I start looking for, you know, folks like the ready, who have greater capacity to actually then assist uh, with uh, the deeper yeah. journey of uh, uh, reorganizing. Yeah. Okay. That's that. That makes that makes a lot of sense. And as you refer back to you know kind of being a, a solo wizard going into these organizations, it makes me want. I'm, I'm curious to know how how has this work changed over the last you know eight years uh, since writing How to Lead a Class? Um, <laughs> oh, are gosh. you finding? Oh God. Uh, Are yeah. you finding the conditions that you are coming into in these organizations are quite different than they were in, in the early days or just, uh, yeah, bring, bring us along to how, how your yeah. world has changed uh, in the last eight years. I, thank you for the questions. And I've got questions. So I'm going to bounce back to you. So this is sure. so important. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I'd be curious to see what you I mean, cause you're, you're like, yeah. you're part of OG, you know, ready crew yeah. and stuff like that. I'd be curious from your perspective too. So in a moment, I'm going to bounce this question back to you. Great. From my sense, I look back eight years ago and gosh, what a lovely place the world was. The things we were fretting about, you know, this is the rise of the hipsters and so on, where it's all ever nuanced, you know, types of coffee. And um, yeah. there was a kind of naivete about the the world. My, my biggest mistakes with the, not mistakes, if I was to write How to Lead a Quest again today, there would be probably two key things that I would... Um, probably three key things that I would um, change. The first is um, greater uh, greater empathy for the attention slash distraction economy that we live within. Like mm -hmm. for most leaders, I already had a sense of this, but most leaders are, uh, you know, it's such a distraction environment. We then double down on efficiency, which leads to a Jevons paradox where we become cursed with efficiency and we become so incremental in our focus that we, we lose the capacity for bigger thinking. Most... Leaders nowadays don't read science fiction. They're not actually feeding their information, uh, their imagination. Um, so that I'd have empathy around that. I'd also probably emphasize the impact that smaller cohorts can make. Um, there's been times where clients have read How to Lead a Quest and wanted to do a big quest leadership program, but then they involved everyone and it just became like the aesthetics of questing and not the actual reality of grappling with um, mm -hmm. ambiguity and the unknown. But the third thing is mostly a how to lead a quest. I made the distinction between meaningful progress and the delusion of progress. Uh, the delusion of progress being where default thinking gets in the way of meaningful progress, where we end up perpetuating incrementalism. And meaningful progress is that which brings us closer to future relevance, a uh, future state where whatever we're doing makes sense. Future relevance is, it haunts me. It's like my main beacon, but I think I would have been wiser to also add for the mercenaries, future salience is probably 
better business outcomes in the short to midterm. Salience is what is shining bright. Like at the moment, I see so much overinvestment in artificial intelligence. It's like so much hype and furor about it. It's, it's so silly in many senses, but it's also where the attention is. And so even though a lot of the stuff isn't relevant, it's salient and therefore a lot of money and investment flows that way. Uh, right. So yeah, I'd be a little bit more pragmatic about that. So a few things that I would change now, I, I, eight years later, I really worry about people's capacity to think deeply, to actually imagine and explore and work collectively. I think that the multipolar yeah. traps, like the, the rivalrous dynamics of the landscape that we're in make it very hard unless you have significant margin, uh, very hard to actually engage in this type of thinking unless you also, or, or if you, if you try to stay artisan and stay relatively in the S small to medium enterprise company. But right. yeah. yeah. How, how about you? Like what have you noticed in the last uh, eight years or so? When, or when did you start with the ready? How, how long has it been? So the ready started in the summer of 2015 and I, I was the first employee. So just a couple of weeks after that, I think my start date was like early September, 2015. Um, so I've been, you know, around, around since the beginning. And I think the, the hesitation you're hearing from me is trying to pull apart evolution of kind of internal structure and approach to the work of the ready and then the actual work, uh, it's itself. And those are kind of like two, two separate things in, in my mind. Um, when it comes to doing the work or, you know, actually engaging with, with our clients, there's something, there's something around us engaging more earnestly with the existing hierarchy within, uh, organizations. I think the ready early days, very much, um, you know, self-management or bust in a lot of ways if we're thinking about um, organizations and especially, I mean, definitely for how we run ourselves. And that is still mostly true, although I think our understanding of what self-management looks like for us has uh, become much more nuanced and much more contextual. But the um, way I just find myself working much more with leaders and r realizing that the influence that they have can be put to good use. Um, and mm. we don't have to like hand wave around the fact that we're ex existing in this kind of top down hierarchical system while trying to introduce principles of greater autonomy and, and self management esque ideas into these organizations and have found that we can have much greater impact, um, kind of playing with the powers that be, um, differently or kind of more on their, on their field, um, Ooh. as opposed to coming in really radical, um, and, and, you know, having basically coalescing the small number of radicals within an organization, but then very quickly kind of getting put into a box or hitting that ceiling where yeah. the impact doesn't really spread much beyond that. Yeah. It's a, it's a subtle thing, isn't it? Um, cause even when you say like the, the, the radicals being put into a box. It's almost like if we relate to the uh, enterprise as a living system, it's like the organism yeah. of the enterprise kind of just, just kind of containing, containing yeah, the, the radical immune system element. gets kicked up. And oh you yeah. Get, yeah. You get, you get, you know, into a, uh, I don't, I don't know biology well enough to know where the infections go. Are you in a, are you in a boil or something at that point on the skin? I don't know. You're somewhere <laughs> yeah, yeah, away yeah. from the yeah. rest of the, yeah. where you That's can't right. affect the rest of the body. Cyst department. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, uh, but yeah, this subtlety, I think, uh, I mean, this is one of the things where, you know, masterful facilitators, when you're looking at what they're doing, they're not simply invisible, but they're making a process kind of emerge like magic. Um, they're adding the right questions at the right time with just the kind of right thing to be subversive, but not to throw things off and, and just really creating those conditions where change is possible. And uh, yeah, similarly, I would relate to that, that kind of, you know, there's a brashness to how I entered the scene, you know, talking about delusions of progress and so on. And I think that there is, that the metaphor I like to think of sometimes is like the judo flip or the Aikido move where you kind of, kind of run alongside the existing structure and then find those points of leverage to kind of flip it into a, a better way. 
But meanwhile, subtly, I just love how the ready shows up. Like um, I was looking at the about page and just the fact that everyone's listed in alphabetical order on the about page is not, yeah. you know, there's, <clears throat> there's something that I, um, when a leader matures, <clears throat> the ultimate point of maturity for a leader is ultimately to decentralize themselves, to, to kind of create conditions where they're not actually needed because they've right. been so effective as a leader that it do that. The irony is that when you do that, a lot of folks don't recognize that you're doing that. You know, they, they, they don't see sure. what you're doing because they, they, they're not there yet to see that stuff. So there's an interesting tension in playing amidst it. But I imagine the fact that you and the way that you work, it's not some flash in the pan kind of here's your, here's your you know, three-step transformation process boot camp over <laughs> yeah. three days or whatever and then see you later. Yeah. It's because you develop the rel relationality I imagine there's a pretty intimate coaching component that happens with some of the teams that you work with. There absolutely, yeah, there absolutely, absolutely is. And that reminds me of another evolution from our early days that I think is really interesting and maybe somewhat counterintuitive is that early days, it was co-create everything, start from scratch, everything. Um, and you do that enough times and you start to realize we do the same moves every time. So mm. is there is there a way we can shortcut this a little bit where we can actually have a, a little bit of a prescription? We're not gonna there's we're not pulling something off the shelf and saying, here's your three steps, but we do know that hey, generally, if you don't have a, a great default operating rhythm at this point, that'll help. So let's, mm. let's go ahead and, and, and get that up and running and, and see how, how we can um, start making progress a little bit faster, uh, which I think was definitely a bit of a transition for us where early on it was like, let's just start like, where are your tensions? And we'll start there. And of course, the tensions are almost always the same because all organizations <laughs> have similar sorts of challenges because it's about human beings coming together to try to do complex work whether you're in banking or manufacturing, sure, there are specifics that look different, but the, the broad patterns are quite similar. So let's, let's yeah. get started sooner if we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there was this uh, romanticizing of Pixar's, you know, every time we start a new film, we delete all the other code from the previous ones. So we're starting from scratch. That was, a, that was a vibe that was happening back in the, you know, around 2015 or something with Creative Inc., I think, when that came out. That's cool. Yeah. That's lovely. I tried, I attempted that too, but you're right. There are patterns. And this is, if we go back to compl complex systems, right? Part of the, the beauty of uh, complex systems is you start to notice fractals. You start to like zoom out and whether it's a cell or, a, you know, an organ or a, a you know, complete yeah. living being and so on. There are self-similar patterns that exist throughout this. And so your acuity, because you have navigated complex systems across contexts, you will have, um, you know, a sense of the, the pattern language or at least the, the acuity to recognize, okay, there's some patterns going on here. Like right. uh, when I approach things, I, I'll sometimes think of jazz, you know, you know, with, with good jazz, you kind of want to like hit some sort of things, but then you want to allow plenty of space for kind of improvisation and emergence, but there's still also a sense of pattern to it. Um, well, and, and, yeah. and, and an error in jazz is just a jumping off point often for something more interesting and thinking about, you know, going on a quest or experimenting and the experiment not working. It's that's, it could be more like just a wrong note in, in jazz, which is now a variation on, on what, where we thought we were going. Yeah, exactly. Oh, seeing as I'm, I have the chance to ask this and I'm going to ask this on behalf of listeners that, um, I think would be curious. Um, what's the sense of like, what is emerging within your context and the ready? Like I always like asking the sense of, and I'm going to give permission to think and draft here, right? Because this is not sure. certain, but it looks like we're in for some very interesting years and in like many senses, volatility seems to be going up in a global context. A lot of companies are trying to figure out what to do. Uh, there's something that happens when there's there's increasing uncertainty is that people kind of tend to cling to what is safe and known but then that sometimes isn't a safe move themselves. And I'm just curious from your sense of the ready, what are you seeing emerging or what, what are some of the things that you're paying attention to? 
something. Yeah, I love I love the question, and I think you'd get twenty different answers if you asked everybody at oh. at the ready, kind of depending on you know where they've been spending their time recently and and what they've been been thinking about. Um, you know, for for me, it's funny. My first my first instinct when you ask that question is to um, r- almost to reject the premise that that <laughs> Great. we can see have like that that the things that we are seeing in the future are going to be um, anything that we have to that we can even really understand at this point. I mean, I'm, I'm basically sitting here thinking about the end of 2019 and being, and and you asking me that question and me absolutely not answering the question with worldwide pandemic and how do we respond to it Mm, and mm -hmm. the ramifications uh, for the 10 years afterward, as all of our organizations are questioning the fundamental assumption of whether we need to actually be in physical presence with each other to get work done and basically overnight proving to ourselves that we do not. Uh, And, everything that has kind of fallen out from there. So organizations that I'm working with every day now, you know, are still dealing with that. Are we, are we doing a return to office? Uh, If yes, how, if not, what are we doing with our offices? Um, Have we fundamentally looked at our operating system from pre COVID times to now and adjusted it to our reality? Or are we still somehow in this world of copying and pasting our old ways of working into this very dynamic kind of hybrid way of working? Many organizations have fundamentally rethought what it means to actually do this work. And many, many, many more have not. And they're the ones showing up in news stories of these completely botched return to office initiatives and, and things of that nature. So I, I don't know if that's a real answer or just me kind of copping out and, and, and not that's a great answer. being willing yeah. to play, but like that's, Oh, I yeah. don't know. I feel like I've been burned by this too many times to like even oh, get <laughs> totally. me on recording saying like, Oh, this thing is going to be it. Oh, I, I certainly wasn't looking for any prediction, but I do appreciate I, yeah. the move. <laughs> I, I, I am, you know, I do this a lot of times too. It's like, it's like the smoke bomb thing, but the smoke has glitter in it. Yeah. And it's a nice, you know, I, I I, but there is something within that question that I noticed, like this this tension about the return to work thing. What's make what's certainly clear within the context here in um, in Australia and other clients that I've worked with um, is sometimes uh, you know you have organisations that have just invested in real estate <laughs> and they want to they want to yeah. make a return, like they they bought offices and they're like, well, shit. Uh, what yeah. do we do? And like, we can't write this. Well, well, let's return back to work. And you know, there's other there's there's things that are still getting built and so on. And so, there's an incentive skew to fill these spaces. And there's also that the comfort of um, you know, this is what we're used to. This is what we're known for. Yeah. A lot of executives do their work face to face. They don't have to uh, work necessarily in an asynchronous thing. So it's comfortable for them. But gosh, like the lessons that we've learned uh, in the last half a decade, the, the, the freedoms, the, the vitality that some folks that otherwise would feel oppressed within the workplace that are just suddenly flourishing. It's like, we've certainly learned, yes, we don't need to do this. We can distribute our cognition and we can coordinate effectively around the world without having to be synchronized the whole time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and at the same time, I look at, you know, somebody like my, my wife who, just started a new job and she specifically wanted a job where she would not be working from home, where she would be coming into an office and she thrives in an environment like that. And I know she's not alone. I am talking to you today from my home office where I work every day, unless I am happening, happening to be on site with a client. And that is always fun, but I love working from home the way, the way that I do. And my experience is not the only experience uh, that exists in the world. Course, Never mind the whole sector of uh, sectors of of folks who don't even have the option of whether or not they're working remotely sure. or not because the, sh- the the shop is here, the factory is here. Uh, yeah. You know, you got to be able to do it. So <laughs> that's right. That's it's right. so it's so it's so interesting. I mean, this is this is complexity. This is this is um, you know, it's this is but why it's so interesting to do this work. I- and and then 
one of the, the lacking things I find in most leadership teams is creating the space for these conversations. Like these are, these are conversations, yes. these are tensions that are worth leaning into and keeping alive as conversations. There are no immediate right or wrong answers. There's a plural, pl plurality of responses available. Yeah. But the reality is we have such a metric obs obsession in this distraction economy that our attention skews to that which can be easily measured and that keeps us so yeah. blinkered. Um, there's this metaphor that I came across um, uh, <clears throat> in fantasy land, there are basilisks. Are you familiar with a basilisk? Yeah. Of course you are. Um, so when a basilisk <laughs> looks at something, it, it, it turns it into stone. And so yes. the effective um, experience of the basilisk is they look through life and everything is dead. Everything is turned into stone. Right. And I feel like sometimes in organizations, particularly as the hangover from the industrial era, we have leaders that are so groomed to just look through everything through the lens of quantified metrics and they miss the livingness yeah. of it. They, they miss the qualitative, the sense making, the, the kind of vibrancy and aliveness. And they're simply looking at the measures and using that as their only uh, uh, right. gauge to, to make sense of things. And that's, that's one of, the, that's one of the, the key things that I think collectively across all contexts people could do better at is that leaning into more Absolutely. qualitative sense making. Yeah. 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 And I, I've done, and I'm, I have some recency bias here just with the client that I'm, that I'm currently working with, but you know, I've worked with lots of senior leadership teams where I asked them like, all right, so, you know, what in, in your existing kind of uh, stack of meetings, like when does the leadership team come together and just kind of make sense of what is happening in the world externally and the vast majority have no time set aside for that. And if they do, they have created a container where the expectation is that they have landed on some next actions. Um, like <laughs> yes, if we're going to come together and meet oh, for an hour and talk about the, the complexity of the world, sure, just as long as we're going to take some action on it afterward. And yeah. there's, yeah. there are, I, I, on the one hand, I admire the bias toward um, some, some progress. You know, I'm a, I'm a GTD guy at heart. I love a good next action. It's how we move forward. And also, um, let's give ourselves some realistic expectations for what we are trying to accomplish when sense making, when just trying to get more in tune with what is happening within our organization or within our nearby external environment. Mm. Yeah, totally. The, the poet Joan Keats has this phrase, negative capability, the uh, ability for, for any of us to kind of be amidst ambiguity of conflicting things and so on without irritably grasping for solutions. And again, yeah, we are so groomed towards action that we will prematurely collapse a possibility space into a known form just so that we have a box that we can tick where I think that ideally, you know, leaders ought to be shielding folks doing the work from unnecessary admin burden. And then also starting to have a sense of like, where are we heading towards? What does meaningful progress look like? And holding that tension alive without it necessarily having to, to kind of immediately take a, an actionable form. Um, I think Nassim Taleb in Anti-Fragile talks about like the benefits of procrastination, the kind of active right. non-doing, resisting the kind of temptation to intervene and potentially cause harm in the process of intervening or at least to, you know, snuff their possibilities. And instead, you know, the procrastinating leader is actively procrastinating. It's kind of like actively holding the space alive. And when the right kind of initiative and the quiver of options kind of comes to vote, then you can kind of take the action at the right time. Yeah. But if you haven't invested yeah, I mean, the it's time just, it's, having the conversations, you know, you won't know what to do. Well, it's, it's, it's the same idea. I mean, I'm pretty sure in, in agile software development, I think is, is where um, this idea comes from, but just making um, decisions at the last responsible moment. It, mean, it, it ensures that you have yes. all of the information yeah. that you can possibly have and then making the, that, yeah. that decision. Yeah, preservation of optionality, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'd love to take a, a, a little bit of a, like a left turn here, um, if it's okay sure. with you. And, and I would love to know, um, to what extent have the ideas that you wrote about in How to Lead a Quest, do you use them in just your like everyday life? Uh, as well, or how yeah. do you use those uh, ideas in just your everyday navigating the world as a, a human being? Oh man, honestly, I've cursed myself with this book. Like 
<laughs> Introducing the concept of meaningful progress as distinct from the delusion yeah. of progress, like yeah. depending on the frame of what you look at, like there, there's part of me. Have you heard of the concept of the meta crisis? I've heard the phrase, but I'll need you to explain. Okay, so the meta crisis looks at the generated functions that give rise to what could be called the poly crisis, where you've got climate change, social collapse, food, you know, crises, refugee crises, economic collapse, all of these things, and it and it comes down to, uh, you know, a fairly common set of um, generator functions: uh, rivalrous dynamics, Jevons paradox, multipolar traps. Um, and then you look at money itself, uh, that relies on abstraction, extraction and accumulation and the market doesn't factor in environmental externalities and so on. And so I'm acutely aware of all of these tragic, uh, self-terminating, you know, civilizational self-terminating trajectories are on, not to mention the AI accelerant to all of that. And then I come back to the question of meaningful progress. <laughs> I'm like, gosh, what do I do? What am I doing? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, which is why I need more of that teacherly uh, thing of kind of meeting folks where they're at. Because, yeah. you know, I'll, yeah. I, I went through this phase where I'd insta-depress people at dinner tables. Um, so, so um, but other th elements of How to Lead a Quest, like the rituals, uh, having an acuity around meaningful rituals and trying to respect them. And I know the ritual sounds a bit woo. It can be woo if you want it to be, but it can also I be love, just quite I love pragmatic. The idea of rituals. Yeah. Yeah. What's one of your rituals that uh, that is quite important to you? Um. Gosh, I have so many. Uh, actually, for for a self-proclaimed uh, non-woo person, because I think I'm using a maybe a less <laughs> exciting definition of of ritual. But you know, my my mornings are sacred to me, and I will yeah. happily get up at an absurdly early time or get not get enough sleep so that I will have that at least hour of like by yeah. myself with a cup of coffee sitting in my chair and reading something. Mm -hmm. Um, I, that's almost a, a non-negotiable and it, and it, and it centers me in, in my day in a way that feels, um, essential to kind of who I am and how I like to operate in the world. Oh, yeah, I, I I'm with you. And I know that you also hand make your coffee. It's not just some machine or yeah, something like course. that. You're, you're, you're hand making it. And so the actual, <laughs> yeah. the motions of going through that, there is a, there is a ritualized practice to that, which is, which is magic. I, I would love for more leaders to be aware of the rituals that help them to center themselves, to kind of connect back to what is true and real because I mean, the forces, the gravitational forces are to be, you know, looking on your phone straight up in the morning, responding to things in, into yeah. reactionary mode. And where is the time otherwise for the cultivation of self-development and imagination? I have another question, by the way, before you go to wrap up, I'm going to like, I've got another question. Sure, for you. sure. Um, uh, what science fiction books are you reading and loving at the moment? Or what's the latest <laughs> thing that you've been love? I know that you're, a new, I'm a, I'm a big yeah. fan of sci-fi too. So I loved the ministry for the future. I read it probably yeah. about, uh, probably about a year and a half ago. Um, I always tell people that that first chapter of describing the heat oh, God. wave in India was the yeah. most harrowing thing I have ever read. Um, so that there's a lot of, of, of interesting stuff in that book. I mean, and then recency bias for me, I've recently been reading, um, uh, Tchaikovsky's um, Children of series, so Children of Time, Children of Ruin, Children of Something, uh, yeah. which I yeah I mean I were I haven't yet sat down and thought about at least consciously what's what's the takeaway from this in a really applicable way. There may be none, but I just uh, really I I marvel in the. Um, just being just kind of like sitting at the feet of masterful storytellers, because I feel like if I were better at it, it would be actually useful in my work to like tell the story of like what we are trying to do in an organization. I feel I am often entirely too rational all the time uh, and and unable to kind of like tap into other things. So. I, that, that's like the main thing that I, that I take away from, from books and like that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. 
I could talk about sci-fi yeah. stuff all day. The, yeah. the Expanse series, uh, loved oh, and yeah. finished recently. And the yeah. culture. How about series? you? Have you read Ian Banks? Have you read Ian Banks' culture mm-hmm. series? I have not. The no. culture. Oh, the culture. No. Phenomenal. Oh, great. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll write it down. Uh, right now. What I believe what, Rodney Rodney wants to spin up a sci-fi book club at the ready. Uh, oh, specifically fantastic. because there, I think that is where there are ideas that are worth digging into and kind of following out into the future. And we don't need to read, yeah. um, you know, more business books. Yours doesn't That's count right. because That's right. it, yeah. because it's, cause oh, it, yeah. yours, the way I described your book to my brother, I was at a, a, a um, family reunion last weekend. I was like, it's like if the best uh, dungeon master you've played with wrote a book about business uh, oh, that's nice. And that's yeah. that's the, that's the vibe. If if no if, yeah. no if you haven't read How to Lead a Quest yet, you you should you should do that. I, I, I must admit, when I look at the business book section, sometimes like there's this part of me that just groans and like <laughs> dissatisfaction. Sometimes um, yeah. it's it's nice to find the glimmers. And yes, looking to fiction and particularly science fiction, I think is a really important um, source of nourishment for leaders that are wanting to yeah. venture beyond the default. Um, I've read Tchaikovsky, was it Tchaikovsky, the Tchaikovsky, Children of Time. Adrian Tchaikovsky? Yeah, he has amazing yeah. eyebrows, by the way. He's like, oh, his really? eyebrow game oh, is I like incredible. All right. um, but <laughs> the thing I look for in the culture and other sci-fi books is what does society look like in a more developed form in the future? Mm-hmm. And these are things where they've, they've discarded with things like money and other things like that. There's like inherent egalitarianism. There's kind of a sense of equality. There's a developmental maturity, uh, you know, an, an awareness of one's own allergies, uh, the emotional development, the, like, all of this stuff is just fascinating to read because it's quite prescient and it's a little beacon as to how we might approach things. So, you know, maybe that, that, that appears in your sci-fi thing, but, um, Thank you for answering that. It's always nice. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious for... as we do this, we're kind of geeking out on a little side note that uh, <laughs> might only appeal to five percent of your listeners. But uh, it's it's but... possible, and ultimately, Jack, our all-knowing editor, uh, has the final say, uh, and he has a good uh, good sense of that. So if this ends up as okay. a YouTube clip only, then that's just a little little <laughs> uh, Easter egg for the uh, for the video watchers. Great. great All right. Great. I've got one last question, and then we'll uh, we'll close it out here. Um, and speaking of Jack, he he proposed that we uh, we end on this one. So I'm gonna you I'm gonna channel my best uh, my best Jack here. So in How to Lead a Quest, you talk about how many companies reach the end of their growth arc and then fall prey to the Kraken of Doom, with the uh, as the result of a series of reasonable decisions, which is a, a great phrase. Having done this kind of work with companies for almost a decade, what are the types of unreasonable decisions you think companies should be making in this moment? In this moment, uh, gosh, I would, one experiment is to imagine what would meaningful progress look like without metrics? If we were to have the conversation where we talk about what meaningful progress looks like for the endeavors that we're doing, but we're not allowed to use any numbers to describe it. Uh, we yeah. can use relative terms, but, uh, you know, it, and if, then if we start to expand into what are some of the stories that we could imagine being written about us if we were to undertake this? And this is where stories are such powerful containers for complexity, because you can take a story that is conjured from five years into the future, bring it back to the present, and it's only, you know, a few hundred words or whatever, but there's an, that's enough for people to start to imagine into the possibility of what, what could this be like if we were to do this? And then let the yeah. metrics come. If there's some, if you know, if you intuitively feel an energy towards that because you're sensing that this is a, this is a pathway towards, you know, enduring relevance or future relevance, lean into that and then start to expand yeah. that from there. Um, whereas normally we do it the other way around. We kind of focus on all the knowns. We look at the incremental improvement and so on, and there's barely any time to actually imagine into what could be. And so I'd, I'd suggest that that would be an approach if we want to really start to, um, you know, take a radical turn from the, you know, incremental bandwagonism and banality of safe, prudent, reasonable decisions that ultimately leads us into you know, the clammy embrace of the inevitable kraken of doom, which feeds <laughs> upon the sweet nectar of your impending irrelevance. Um, you know, I would start to have those kinds of conversations. Amazing. Really appreciate you joining us uh, today. I think, I think that's a good place to wrap this conversation up. 
only really because of time. I feel like uh, content wise, we have at least another four hours in us. So we'll have to uh, we'll have to bring you back when when Rodney is feeling uh, up to it and we can uh, do this again. Oh, we can go and, super and woo. I go love it. All yeah. sorts of, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, Jason, if people want to know more about you and the work that you do, what do you where should they go? What should they check out? Well, there's two sources. I have drjasonfox.com, drjasonfox.com, which is my corporate propaganda. This is where I smuggle, you know, use this <laughs> to smuggle me past the gatekeepers of your enterprise. Uh, and then we can work our magics there. And then I have foxwizard.com, which is my ultimately career limiting uh, personal <laughs> newsletters where I share what I'm thinking about in the world and uh, ultimately confuse people and lose work. Um, so. <laughs> There's a couple of choices for you. We're always looking for new topics for the show. Uh, so if you have an organizational pattern that you're having trouble changing, shoot us a note at podcast at the ready.com. And if you have cool people like Jason, you want us to talk to tell us that too. This show is engineered by Taylor Marvin and produced by Jack Van Amberg at work with the ready is created by the ready where we help organizations around the world change the way they work. Thank you for listening. Thank you.